Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 93, end of May AMA. From the mountaintop, I'm Sean, and live from the only Canadian city south of the U.S., the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You too can join us Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. And get to see the sausage get made with all the problems we've had so far tonight. So tonight we are answering your gaming and game night questions here live, talking to our chat room. We've also got a review of a new game from Bicycle Cards called The Alpha. A really busy Bellhop's Tabletop Week in review this week as well with plays of Quad Heroes, uh, More of the Alpha, Level X, Codenames, Codenames Duet, uh, Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, and Sanctum. Now, I do want to apologize for anyone watching this on YouTube for my video quality this week. I realize my video is very small. We know. We are aware. We are trying to fix it. Unfortunately, Skype patched two days ago on the 25th and is now doing something different when it decodes the video, which I'm sure is to make for a better video conference. But it keeps changing my quality as my internet uh, or as the internet fluctuates. So I keep growing and shrinking and it's getting to be a little bit too much work trying to keep me at the same size. So we're just going to run with it this week and hopefully next week we'll have that fixed, uh, possibly by moving away from Skype. Sorry, Microsoft. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we receive, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of online. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We adore your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Or you can hit me up on social media. Uh, I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Up first, a comment, Ulf Bengensen, on our Eclipse Second Dawn unboxing. Ulf writes, so good. Live this game. Thanks yes. for the comment, Ulf. Now, I'm guessing that Live was probably meant to be Love, but you know what? There's enough in that box. That is a massive box, lots in it. It could very well be a lifestyle game for some players. So either way, thumbs up. Thanks for the comment, Ulf. All right, well, on that same unboxing video, Jer Kasanen, one of the artists on Eclipse Second Dawn, commented, Please contact, redacted, let's get those com components fixed ASAP. All right. First off, I have to thank Jared for commenting. Uh, I've commented before how awesome it is when a publisher or a designer actually finds our content and goes out on the web and finds content, creators' content on their stuff and actually gets involved and interacts and, 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 and comments on that content. And I think that's fantastic. And I think this is the first time that we've gotten any feedback from an artist. And that's pretty cool. It's pretty interesting that even the artists on the games are out there seeking it out. Now, regarding the missing components, I got to say, uh, first thing I did, and this is what I think most people would do, is I have a Kickstarter missing component. So I went to the Kickstarter and I sent them a message on Kickstarter. And while Colossal Games didn't like that much and decided to berate me for not reading every single dang update they posted and missing the one where they happened to give that email address off. Well, fair enough, whatever. Um, they gave me the email address, so I wrote the email address. Um, I don't know if it was an English as a second language problem or what, but first they offered to replace just the ships. So then I had to point out and send them pictures showing, no, it's all the yellow components, not just the ships. But at this point, it seems like the communication's done, and supposedly I have replacement parts coming from Finnum. Now, I have no clue how long that's going to take with what's going on in the world right now, but hopefully I've got some yellow ships and components for Eclipse showing up soon. All right, well, sticking with YouTube video comments, Quinn Swanger had this to say about our Arboretum actual play. What's with moving the tree at the end after you already planted it? Don't recall this from the rules, and don't recall if you had an explanation for this. House rule? In the video. Thanks. All right, well, that actual play of Arboretum was recorded during Renegade Games Worldwide Play Day for Arboretum. During that event, the Renegade team was sending out worldwide events for all the people playing to use during their games. One of the global events was that we could move the tree. The actual wording was 
You may move one card in your Arboretum to a new location at the end of the game just before scoring. And that's why we moved a tree. There were other global events that came out, like on your next turn, you can select cards from anywhere within the discard pile. So you might have also seen us in the video go through the discard pile. And there was a suit at the random at the start of the game that were considered um, all colors as well. So there were a bunch of those going on. Now, one of the reasons I brought this up on the podcast, because I did reply to this directly, it's just something similar actually came up recently with board games and bourbon. Glenn was complaining. I, I don't know about complaining. Observation will say and what he said was that it seems like no matter what your video content is meant to highlight whatever it's supposed to be about whether it's a, an unboxing or if just showing off the components or it's a house ruled actual play i'm playing with my six-year-old kid and they're just goofing with the components it seems like many people are going to try to use it as a teaching video in particular, his video for the Alpha, which we're going to talk about later tonight, in one example where he just randomly tossed the wolves out onto the tiles quickly to show that you place wolves on tiles in the game. But he didn't follow the actual restrictions on the tile. And he got multiple comments within the first hour of the video going live from people pointing out, you can't do that. Wolves can't go. You can't put more than one wolf on the livestock in particular. Similar to that, I got contacted by Jim Pinto earlier this week, and he noted he was watching our Call of Cthulhu Death May Die video, our actual play, and I'm like, oh, cool, I'm glad you're watching it. And after talking to him for a bit, I learned he's watching it to learn how to play. And I'm like, whoa, Jim, just be careful, because this wasn't meant to be a teaching vid. And he's like, well, what do you mean it's not a teaching vid? At the start of the video, you teach your friends how to play. And I'm like, well, it was our first time ever playing the game, and I am sure we probably messed something up. That's one of the bellhop's rules, right? Your first play is always an extreme play. I don't remember now. That was a long time ago, but I am certain we messed something up in one way or another. And I warned Jim about this. And then Jim was like, well, then why'd you put the video up if it's not going to teach people to play? And I'm like, wow. So I think this is something any of us who create content on YouTube or video content, it doesn't have to be on YouTube. It could be anywhere. It could be right here on Twitch. That You should keep in mind that while making the video for whatever purpose it is, whatever you're trying to show off, whatever you're trying to do with the video, there's a good chance that someone out there is watching it to learn how to play the game, even if that wasn't your intention. So I have a uh, possible suggestion. I, I may, we may look at, uh, at some of our content uh, and, and look at things, whether or not we are doing any sort of a teaching video or an expl explanation video. And if not, um, it's real easy to just slap a little label on the bottom yeah. across the bottom that says not, a, not, a, you know, not for teaching yeah. purposes. Th this video um, is not for int er, er, instructional <laughs> purposes or something yeah, like that. You know, that. just, you know, something, you know, uh, low, low scale, you know, semi-transparent, nothing super, yep. nothing crazy, but a light watermark to let people know that, you know, don't, don't use this for training because we're goofing around in it. Or, you know, there's some other reason why you shouldn't be using this for training. Yeah. Exactly. Like our unboxing videos. I've had people complain that I got wrong what the component was for, even though at the beginning of the unboxing video, they say, I've never seen this game before. I've never played it before. And I'm just going to assume what things are for. And I'll be like, oh, this looks like it's a player board. It's going to be used for this. Oh, sorry. It wasn't a player board. It was a central board that everyone uses. Well, when yeah. I looked at it, it looked like a player board. And yeah. I have gotten called out on that too. So, yep. Well, we can't we please all of the people all of the time. So, <laughs> that's true. Now, one uh, video comment, uh, this one coming from Board Game Geek, Crown of Command, pointed out a small problem with our Tanto Core review. Partway okay. through the video, you started calling the game Tante Quoro. All right, I apologize, Crown of Command. Um, to be honest, when I first learned the game, I thought it was Tante Quoro. That's how I pronounced it That's when I was talking to anyone about the game. Not that it came up all the time. And it wasn't until Japan Game Games sent me a review copy that I actually looked it up and found out it was Tonto Kore. All right, close enough. I admit I probably should have tried to stick to the proper pronunciation, but it seems like once we got talking back and forth, I just slipped back into what I originally thought the name was. My bad. We, uh, there's, a, there's a few, uh, a few games. Uh, Agricola, for one, that yes. <laughs> slips up on this show. Uh, we, we are not here to teach pronunciation. See, I, I, I constantly, whenever I talk about Agricola, I always try to make sure that I pronounce it Agricola at least once. That <laughs> way I keep everyone happy. There you go. Uh, up next, a comment about our episode from a couple of weeks back using the five senses to increase immersion. John Ray, uh, Rayher writes, On the food front, always make sure you know the dietary preferences of your player's GM. 
I game with folks that range from full omnivores to vegetarians to folk with, folk with lactose and other allergies. Make sure your vegetarian friends don't mind having folks eat meat at the same table as them. If they do, find out if your carnivore friends would like to try an all veggie night. And if neither can agree, see if there is a compromise you could come to, like veggie pizza and pepperoni pizza or similar. I think from now on, I'm going to do it the other way where I'm like, you know, if you can't deal with me eating meat, I don't want to watch you eating that asparagus. We're done. Sorry, we can't eat together at game night. No, fair enough. Uh, thanks for the comment, John. It makes perfect sense, right? This is always an important thing to consider anytime we're talking about food on game night, whether it's something you're doing to increase immersion or if it's just a matter of getting together before the game for dinner, having snacks at the table while you're playing or ordering pizza in the middle of the night, whatever it is, or even going for dinner after the meal. You want to try to take into account dietary preferences and restrictions. All right. Well, next we've got a comment on an older article about the best word-based board games. Dan Richter writes... You should look at Sprout Word, a word strategy game for two to four players. It has been described as a, like a blend of Scrabble and chess. Okay. Thanks, Dan. I got to admit, I'd never heard of Sprout Wood before. I did look it up. I grabbed it. I took it up on Board Game Geek, and it looked kind of interesting. I don't know how chess like it looks, but I got to say, there's definitely an area control element where you're trying to get words with most of your color, and you have all your tiles are color coded. And I thought that looked cool. So I'm thinking area control Scrabble sounds kind of neat. What we'll do is what we always do and toss a link in our show notes if anyone else wants to check that out. All right. Well, finally, a couple of comments on last week's topic. Uh, up first, Roger Braslett, who was the one who asked the question in the first place, commented, I like the rolling bin idea. Put all the goblins in one bin, bring it to the table when the goblin fight starts. And Glenn Flaherty writes, the egg carton idea is smart. Well, thanks both of you for the comments. I'm particularly glad Roger, who asked the question, actually did find a new solution, something new in the mix, and not just hearing the same things he's heard before. So that's awesome. All right. That's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so now's the time to make sure you've checked out all our formats. Board Game Geek, Podcast, the website, YouTube, MeWe, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, even Pinterest. Yeah, if it's out there, we're probably on there. Sign up to receive Tabletop Gaming, or Tabletop Gaming Weekly. Whoa. <laughs> Tabletop Bellhop Weekly. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the previous week. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, unboxing videos, whatever it is, it's going to be in that email so you don't miss anything. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. Speaking of something you'll find in the newsletter, Sunday afternoon, I did something new in a way, something I haven't done for quite some time since getting Gentis Deluxe from Kickstarter. And that was to build a box insert. Now this time it was the folded space insert for Eminent Domain, and which has also meant to hold three of the expansions, Escalation, Exotica, and Oblivion. No, I don't have Oblivion, I only have the first two, but whatever. I live streamed this insert build and I wanna thank everyone who showed up to watch. Actually, that was, there was some really good interaction there and some question, good questions asked while I was doing it. It was awesome to have someone in the chat while I was building this insert. If you missed the show, no worries. I've taken the raw video from that live stream, edited it down a little bit, and we'll be releasing that on YouTube tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, just head over to youtube.com slash tabletop bellhop. It'll be live after 3 p.m. tomorrow. Check it out or just watch our social media because I'll be sure to share links once it's live. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and some content that otherwise only our patrons get. Since today is an AMA, and we're going to be spending the next while, uh, the next segment, interacting with the people in our chat room, we're going to jump right over to the Ask the Bellhop segment and keep things moving on. We're here to answer your game, game, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. 
Social media works too. We are everywhere. Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way is for questions to come through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere online or, I guess, in person either. It's the last Wednesday in May, and that means it's time for another AMA. Tonight, we are taking questions from our chat room, The Lobby. In addition, we invite you to call into the show and leave a voicemail through Skype. And we'll play it here live and answer your question right away. To do that, just Skype call to Sean at TabletopBellhop.com. So, uh, we're going to start off. We had a uh, question posted on the blog by Jason. Uh, okay. My question regards uh, the attack modifier deck for Gloomhaven. Is the attack modifier deck always 20 cards? Example, a road card action tells me to add minus one times three to my attack modifier deck for the start of the scenario. Do I just add three minus one attack modifier cards? Or do I add three minus one modifier cards and subtract three so the deck is always equal to 20? All right, I think someone here is a D&D &D player, that's my guess, or someone who uses it, plays D20, F20 games, because I think they're thinking that modifier deck is like the equivalent of a 20-sided die. It is not. The attack modifier deck starts at 20 cards, but can be any size. Uh, so if you are adding three minus one cards to your modifier deck, you're, and you have the initial deck right from the start of the game, you're going to have a 23 deck card. Three, 23 card deck. Through the game, as soon as you get which as soon as you, or as soon as you complete enough in-game things, you're going to click off a perk, you're going to add and remove cards from that deck. Very quickly, very early in the game, that deck is not going to be 20 cards. Now, through playing the game quite a bit, there were some people in a group that got that deck really thin, where they almost knew what was going to come up every time. Whereas my first Craigheart character, I think my deck was up to like 32 cards. I just kept adding and adding and adding and adding stuff to it. So that is a big part of the game. Don't try to think of it as a replacement for a two-hit deck or a two-hit roll in a standard RPG. It is a, a different beast. So just to reiterate, no, your Gloomhaven deck is not stuck at 20 cards. When you add cards, you add them in, and when you remove them, you take them out, and whatever size it ends up is the size it is. All right, well, there we go. There's another little tidbit for all of our Gloomhaven fans out there. Yeah, we got it every now and then. Like, we put out that FAQ. So that's that's our most popular YouTube video is is Sean and I going through the Board Game Geek uh, FAQ for Gloomhaven, which is the official FAQ Isaac and uh, whatever uh, authorized, I guess, endorsed Isaac endorsed FAQ. Um, I have no idea how up to date it is now. Uh, it should be pretty close. Like I, I'm sure there are probably a couple new things that have come up since the original game came out, but we went through that, and that is currently our most popular video on YouTube. Yep. So you can find that over on our YouTube channel. But since putting that out, it seems that enough people seem to think we're Gloomhaven experts, so <laughs> fair enough. Uh, we have played a lot of sessions, and we continue to make mistakes. So it's a, what, 45-page rule book with lots of little idiosyncrasies and little rules, and it's really easy to make a mistake. So one thing is yep. don't feel bad if you're like Jason, and you mess something like that up and like especially if you're coming from another game right if you played descent before you played imperial assault or you played a role-playing game you're going to come in with some preconceived notions about what to expect from gloomhaven and realize that this is a different beast than all of those and uh one thing you know we, we bring it up and we actually harp on it quite a bit in the video but uh grammatically some of the cards yes. are problematic so it's not unusual to you know make mistakes based simply on your interpretation of the writing on the card uh, because it's not always as clear as I feel it should be. Oh, definitely. <laughs> the, the Where the line breaks are matter if something's bold or not matters. And even worse, nowhere is that explained. Nowhere is the grammar explained in the rule book. You're just, it's supposed to, I, I think Isaac must have thought it was implied by looking at it. Yeah. But that is something that's in that FAQ. It's in our video where we talk about if it's bold, it means this. If it's on a separate line, it means this. If there's a line break, it means this. Basically, if it's a line break, it's a separate action. Where if there's no line break, then the, the line applies to whatever's above it. And same thing with bold. Bold are actions, whereas not bold are modifiers for that action, if I remember correctly. Yep. No, it's uh, it's 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 crazy. And, and I think it's one of those things that they got so used to their own cards during play sessions. Yeah. And they probably taught it during play sessions but it was so second nature to them teaching it even during a play session, they just didn't make it into the rule book. That's, uh, you know, one of those things that happened. 
All right. All not right. too many questions in the, in the room. chat room yet. Quiet in there. I know we we may have, hopefully we didn't lose too many people when we were uh, struggling yeah. to, at the start. So now we're going to do a quick question. What happened with the start of the show? Why we were late this morning? <laughs> kind of tossed in the beginning. Skype did update uh, two days ago. And since then is doing nasty things with my video based on what it thinks our internet bandwidth is. It's probably about the best I can explain it. So I do apologize for stuff shrinking and growing. So it turns out that if we were using the other OBS, which we may start doing, um, there is yeah, a solution. They do. Skype, Skype has posted a solution on the Microsoft.com for the other OBS software. Okay. Not Streamlabs. Uh, and so I may, I mean, for, for your stuff, I think you should probably keep using Streamlabs. Uh, but I may on my end take our show and move us over to the other OBS, uh, as there is a solution, um, there is a solution built into that software that right. Microsoft, uh, so, and I mean, we may still move away from Skype because the problem is even if it doesn't resize, the quality will change still. Yes. Um, and and that's part of that I means the reason we are we are resizing is because of uh, bandwidth shaping by Microsoft. Uh, right. But uh, again, I, there is a solution in the in the other software to maintain the size, no matter what. Uh, yeah, that see, doesn't that's, that's and, exactly and I and I just went and I just dug through uh, Streamlabs OBS and that problem isn't there uh, or that solution isn't there that one right. checkbox that I want to be able to hit. So yeah, it's too bad. Yeah. Now there was something else someone just announced that OBS is now doing that Streamlabs used to do, and I can't. I think it's go live direct from OBS now or something. Oh, the, no. uh, my Reddit was filled with OBS got way better like uh, yesterday, last night, and today. So, but it's you not know, like, there might be other reasons. Yeah, to swap back. I've, I've been I've been using OBS for my own uh, purposes. Well, when I'm stream, if if I stream, which doesn't happen much <laughs> much, but yeah. if I stream, it's OBS. But also, I've been using it as a virtual camera for. Um, conference calls so i've already got it set up i just need to move our scenes over to it and that should be there uh all right so we've had our first question in the chat room so uh red meeple ryan asks have you ever received a game recommendation only to learn that the person suggesting the game is the designer or someone who works for the publisher I'm not going to be able to think of specific examples. Plus, I'm not sure if I should highlight specific examples. I think of them, but I have definitely it has happened. Um, I have gotten game recommendations. I have had the the worst is when you were talking. I see this on social media where you are talking about a certain style of game, and the the slightly annoying is you're talking about a certain style of game, and then person jumps in to say, "Hey, have you tried this?" And to be honest, I really don't mind as long as they're upfront about it. Like, please tell me, I might enjoy your game. If I'm talking about abstract games and Mark Spector jumps in and says, hey, you should check out Garinto. That's an abstract game we publish. That's fine. It's when they come in and they do the passive aggressive thing. They're like, hey, have you ever heard of this game called Garinto? It's supposed to be really good. That's when I actually get rather annoyed and upset. Um, I've met people in our gaming community and gaming groups that have been like that. And I just, I hate that schmarmy swarm i don't know like that 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 attitude of oh check out this thing that's really cool that this awesome guy made yeah it's really neat and it's actually there's just i don't know it feels horrible to me in a way now, and will actually turn me off on the yeah. person's game now this actually goes to something that uh, you and i talked about a little bit this week and there's been a, a, a whole bunch of buzz about on twitter and that is game reviews and how you determine uh or how you state things about your game reviews because yes. in this day and age, uh, in, in the world of the pandemic, uh, it's, it's difficult, as we've talked about numerous times on the show, it's difficult to properly review a game. If you yes. don't have four people around, it's really hard to give an opinion on a four-player game mm -hmm. or how a game plays at four players. So a lot of people are turning to virtual tabletops or mm -hmm. other digital solutions for game reviews. And my stance is, if you want to state at the top of your review, hey, I played this on Virtual Tabletop, and this is mm -hmm. my thoughts on the game, great. Because I now know everything I read from that point on is framed in that, okay, right. you played the digital version. And, mm -hmm. and that goes exactly the same for recommendations. Hey, I'm the publisher of Garinto. Yeah. 
you were talking about these games. This game is just like that. Maybe you want to give it a try. Framing is everything and you need that information up front. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, and I don't mind it. Like, like feel free. The, the, the one I, other one I'd mind is when the person interjects their game into every conversation. So I am like, I am looking to play a new 4X game. I want to make sure it's got a really strong exterminate because me and my friends like player versus player con- content. And I'm going to pick on Mark Spector here because I love Mark Spector and I love Garinto. So you know that he's not one of the people who did it. All right. So we're doing this backwards. So instead of instead of blaming a specific company, I'm going to, I'm going to mock blame greater than games because they have not done this. So and, and, and I've had a really good relationship with Mark so far. No, uh, we're not promoted in any way. I reviewed one of his games. That's it. Just we had a really good relationship during that review. But anyway, I'm like, I need a 4X game. Lots of conflict because that's me and my players head to head. We love going at it. And you're like, oh, have you checked out Garinto, an abstract strategy game about the way of the path? A, a very zen game about trying to get your spiritual center. And I'm like, I just said I want a 4X. Like, that or, one or even me. worse, or even worse, they take they take Garinto, which is a Zen peaceful path making game, and try to yes. talk up. Well, you know, you know, if you take the if you take this tile, you're totally messing over that other player. So you can really go head to head by which tiles you take. No, no, you can't. Yeah. Stop trying to reframe your game. It doesn't work yes. that way. So that that's when it bothers me. I really don't mind if a publisher art had, if we had an artist write in earlier today. If a game artist, any of them want to promote their game, tell me your ties to it, please. And second, be honest about it. Like, like don't interject your game in every conversation about games that you're try to fit yours into the niche and give a give an honest opinion. Like I have to assume most publishers like the games they're publishing. But yeah, let us know. Disclosure, right? It's, it's the same thing that goes for the reviews. Frame it properly. Let people know right from the start. Yeah, I, I I had someone come back to me on, on and 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 engage me about my opinion on the uh, the review topic the other day, and I said, look, if you want to review a game by picking up the box and looking at the back of it and giving me a review, go ahead, publish it. Just, Just tell, tell me up front yep. so that I know I can ignore everything you say from that point yes. on. I but go ahead, publish the review. That's fine. It's a legitimate review based on a legitimate you know scenario. Uh, it doesn't tell me anything about the game, but what you have uh you know you followed all the rules and go ahead publish it if you want uh all right i do apologize for any typing sound but our, our <laughs> chat room we got enough people here but we had a rough start today so we lost some people earlier on and i don't blame them we took us over half an hour to get going tonight and that's i admit not very professional i don't think i blame us for it but it's tech issues we probably should have went live a little earlier to work these bugs out who knows whatever could have done it better we lost some people uh, we got another question from uh, Ryan and uh, questions on game tiebreakers. You have any okay. favorite methods uh, or when are there too many tiebreakers? All right, this is an interesting one. Um, one of the, the one of my favorite games I own is called Tiebreaker, and it is from Ted Allspatch, which is Bezier Games, and they are the same company that put out Start Player, and it is a similar thing so start player at one time was my most played game of all time because i used to play that before playing every other game and what that is is it's a game to determine who start player is well ted created a game for tiebreakers and it's a silly party game really to be honest uh there's a giant orange meeple that says tiebreaker and then there's cards you draw the card and the card will have you do something and then the first player who does the thing has to grab the tiebreaker meeple so kind of like spoons and then whoever ends up with the tiebreaker meeple wins the tie, which I thought was rather cute. And the reason I like this is because sometimes I hate the tiebreakers that are in actual games. There, there is a propensity in modern gaming for these cute tiebreakers. And in a way, I read them in the rules and I think they're cute and they're amusing, but I hate them when I go to play. Like, for example, the tiebreaker in Arboretum is go plant a tree and come back in 10 years and see whose tree grew the most. I'm like, come on. Uh, like, I'm going to use that in a board game blitz tournament? Like, that that's what bugs me, right? Because most games are an actual competition. People do care about winning and losing, despite, like, some people take it more seriously than others. And for a whole conversation on that, check out our podcast episode about competition at the table, episode number X, which we'll throw in the show notes. I have no idea what actual number it is. I remember Brian Kurtz asked the question. 
But because of that, I, I, I want a tiebreaker. I don't only want a tiebreaker. I want a second, third, fourth tie. Like, I don't want the player with the most money. Well, what if we have the same money? Then I want then the number of tiles. Okay, what if we have the same money and the same tile? Like, like break it down. I want it probably, on average, three levels at least of tiebreaker, mainly because I play with some people that are that competitive. I run board game tournaments, so I want games. Like, by having a bad tiebreaker, I can't put a game in the board game blitz without throwing in my own tiebreaker, which we have rules for that in the board game blitz at it, of all things it's rock paper scissors but you are welcome to use rock paper scissors instead of the tiebreaker that comes in the box so that's fine um you have anything on this um well for, uh, ryan just started are you okay with a shared victory so what what happens is uh, and unfortunately you can't have an unlimited number of tiebreakers right. at some point it really is just a tie. Uh, we see that on board game uh, arena every once in a while. There's a couple of games where, yeah, there's the tiebreaker for number of coins and there's the tiebreaker for this, but there aren't a dozen different uh, yeah. ways of doing it. At some point, you just have to say, sorry, you're both tied, unless it's a tournament and then you can have yeah. additional versions. But, uh, you know, I, what about uh, what about shared victories? I, again, I'm not a fan. I, I like to have winners or losers. The only time I want a shared victory is if it's team game, right? If I'm playing Battlestar Galactica, the human team wins or the Cylon team wins. That That's when we can have a shared victory, is, is all the humans win or all the Cylons win. I don't want a game where we play Terraforming Mars and we have whatever, the, the all we were at the same Terraforming rating, the same uh, ending mega credits and the same number of projects in our hand. And we're like, hey, we Terraformed Mars. I'm like, now I feel like I wasted three and a half hours of playing the game because... Because we didn't find out who won. Yeah, the, it, it's definitely a bigger problem on some of those long games. Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna commit four hours to playing a game, it's not fun to yeah. just sort of say, like it's just "Yay, not. we won together." Well, no, that's not what I wanted. I I don't even mind losing after four hours, but somebody should win. Exactly. Uh, and actually, you, you bring up a good point there because I don't mind it in Suro. I remember one game of Suro, we had a, I think it was a six-way tie for the end of the game, where all of the things died on the last turn on the last tile, and I thought that was awesome. It was a lot of fun. But Suro is like a 10- to 15-minute game, so that's that's a very different feel than playing a longer, like I said, Terraforming Mars or something like that. All right. Uh, so, uh, and then and Brian does point out, rightfully, a few people remember to mention the uh the tiebreaker in the uh we'll teaching teach. yes um, yes and you okay have just that brings again. us to another topic well similar topic so this goes to the Lulogy podcast i think it was jeff engelstein who was talking about it but i'm not positive it might have been gil hova it was someone on the Lulogy podcast that pointed out just how important the tiebreaker is for a game which is something as a designer needs to think about because whatever you make the tiebreaker is now better than everything else in the game for that one reason. So in Terraforming Mars, you have your, I don't know, how many different resources are there? So there's your Mega Credits, your Steel, your Titanium, it's five, your, it? your, your Trees, your Electricity, and your Heat. So six. six. So you have six different oh, resources. Mega credits, right. that was... Yeah, you have six <laughs> different resources in Terraforming Mars. Well, the tiebreaker that uh, Jacob Phyrexelius put in the game is mega credits. By doing that, he just bumped mega credits above all of those other resources when it comes to end game scoring. So if you have a decision point where you're not sure what to get, your best choice is always go with the mega credits. Be just in case you get to that tie, that's going to put you over the top. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, it's definitely an important portion of the teach. Uh, when when you've got a situation like that, where one resource becomes the the important resource, you know, if you're not, uh, if you're not being competitive, it may not matter. But uh, if you're, if you're in there and you've got those tough decisions to make, knowing which of the resources or which of the game aspects is going to make the difference in the end can really push your decision yeah. in one way or the other. Yeah. And if there's multiple, so if there's three layers, you got to realize that each of those things getting bumped up by a minor amount. Yep. So if the second tiebreaker is cards in hand, well, now you're bumping up. You want to get mega credits and also try to keep some cards in your hand. That is not an actual tiebreaker for Terraformer. <laughs> this is not an instructional yeah, video. You do not you do not want to hold, have, hold cards in your hand yes. in Terraforming Mars. Please don't. 
<laughs> Actually, one of the important things to do in Terraforming Mars is to sell all of your projects before the end of the game because Mega Credits are the tiebreaker. Yep. But yeah, whatever that second tiebreaker is, it's now bumped up a bit. And whatever that third one is, is bumped up. And for every one you have, you are making that particular commodity worth more in the game, which is important to game balance. All right, well, we actually had a question come in through our Discord channel from uh, VIP Jeff Seuss. How has the pandemic impacted traffic on our various publishing platforms? Oh, it's... <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll start off. I'll talk about our uh, the podcast because I see those numbers most mm -hmm. regularly. Uh, interestingly, it hasn't, but our numbers are way, way up anyway. Uh, we actually hit our 10,000 listen mark a little ways back and we, we announced it on the show. And this is, oddly enough, thanks to Pandora, uh, pandora.com. Now, what's really interesting is we actually can't listen to ourselves on Pandora. Uh, we don't, we can't. Uh, pandora.com is geolocked to America. So they have done something. Uh, we don't know what but they have yeah. promoted our content in some manner that we cannot learn about. And uh, that's, uh, that's basically what has, has happened and driven our listens through the roof. Uh, and thankfully, the, our numbers have actually stayed elevated yes, since that... the Pandora promotion has there. So we are showing up on Chartable's top 200 podcasts list. Uh, our yeah. numbers are looking really great, but... Oddly enough, it really has nothing to do with the pandemic that we can tell. Uh, it's down to a promotion through Pandora, who which we appreciate to the great greatly, but we don't understand. So <laughs> yeah, in in particular, it's our episode about old games. Yeah, it's it's licensed games or old games, old uh, games, it's the right? old games. Yeah, yeah. So so it's it's our episode talking about like what old board games are still worth playing somehow I, I don't know i don't know how pandora works like is there pandora podcast where you like put in your podcast preference and you go i like the dice tower and they play a dice tower episode and then they play a something i have no idea we don't have pandora we don't know how to look at it uh other than that like it does seem to be going up and this is the the biggest thing that's important for what we do as content creators is spikes are good spikes are we want to see spikes but what's more important than spikes is that it stays up and every time yeah. you hit a spike that you then level up higher, level off higher than you were before. And that's that's the big thing we hope for is that slow gain. Like a huge spike and staying spike to be awesome, that doesn't happen, right? Yeah. It's kind of like you learn the product life cycle. You hit that spike and a ton of people check you out because there's a spike, whatever that happens to be. Something went viral, some tweet went. Mike Mercer likes something we said on Twitter, retweets something we say, and all of a sudden there's a big spike in views and they check it out and everything goes really great. And... It's great. And then all these people who follow Mercer check us out and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, some of them stick around. That's the important part, right? Is the, the, the sum of the, of the people stick around. And that's what we like to see. Absolutely. Uh, and then uh, what about, uh, what about our, our page views on the website? How is... so, so the start of the pandemic was fantastic for us. And again, we had this huge spike and I think it was just those first two weeks, right? Where everyone, well, not everyone, but a lot of people thought this may only last a couple weeks, that it was like, you're going to stay home for 14 days to flatten the curve and everything will be back to normal. That was being put out there by a lot of people at the time. And we saw a huge spike in those first two weeks for our, our number of page views. And it wasn't one specific post, but it was it was most of the blog. We do have a more popular than, than average post that was doing exceptionally well. And it was great. We saw this huge spike and that was awesome. And then for a while, it dropped but not as low but as this drags on and i think part of it is as summer happens and people are getting outside more and as things are opening up it just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping and i gotta admit we're now lower than we were before the pandemic hit which is not good but we did have a nice spike there was some good page views there and then like i said things have been petering off so we've also been trying to do things to get attention uh like ryan said like the the project to collect all of the, the free games, yes, that is a great service for the community, but it's also trying to get us hits on our webpage. We want people to go to our list. There, there is a slight ulterior motive to that. <laughs> yeah, no, and, uh, and, and we've actually been talking about this in the background a little bit. Uh, one of the things that we're looking to sort of push, you know, we are available everywhere. We, we talk about this every episode. We're, we're on all the social medias and all the different places. Uh, and, and, you know, Tabletop Bellhop is 
what we are and where we are everywhere. But realistically, the best way to get a hold of any of our content is to just go to tabletopbellhop.com. Yes. Uh, because that's where it's all posted. That's where it all starts. Uh, whether it's a YouTube view, whether it's a YouTube video, a podcast, an article, a sale, any of that stuff, that all basically is is amalgamated right there mm -hmm. at tabletopbellhop.com. Yeah. Now, other stuff, YouTube, we're going up, but there's also there's another thing though that I think is driving that more. One of the things I started doing was uh, hosting our YouTube videos on Board Game Geek. And again, I can't tell if there's a pandemic bump or if there's just a, I post our videos on Board Game Geek bump. Now, what I have seen on Board Game Geek is more interaction. I don't get a lot of interaction on Board Game Geek because I don't post in a lot of the threads, but we are seeing comments over there. Uh, one of our comments earlier tonight came from that, and one of our questions tonight, um, sorry, one of our comments earlier, one of our feedback comments was actually from a video on Board Game Geek, two of them actually, the artist and there was another one, whatever, forgetting what we did, but Two of the video comments tonight were off Board Game Geek, not from YouTube. So I that has given us a spike on YouTube. Um, Instagram is doing ridiculously well. I am – so Deanna's measurement of a good Instagram post was, say, 50 likes. If you get 50 hearts, you, that's a good post. Like, I, I did a good post. My posts are averaging now 75 to 90 on, on, on average, and many hitting, like, 120, 130 which still isn't a huge number, but it's up, right? It's almost double the interaction I used to get on YouTube, on Instagram. Part of it is I'm more, I'm now trying to do at least one post a day to Instagram, if not two, on two different accounts. No one cares about my food account here, but on both <laughs> accounts. But I try to share a game pick and a food pick, and then later I'll share another game pick and another food pick. And that one has been great. Like the, uh, the, um, Inter the Instagram interactions have been great. Now, our goal there is to hit 10,000 followers, and I'm 7,000 away. Like, it's exploded. Like, we're not going viral on Instagram. It'd be awesome to hit 10,000, but that's not happening. As for um, subs and so on, they seem to be about steady. Uh, about I don't think we're growing anymore or any, any faster or slower, but everything's going up. Uh, Twitch follows, YouTube fo subscribes. Our, you know, we get a couple, couple yep. a week two, three a week. It's no big spike, no big drop either way. I know that if you're not subscribed on YouTube, I would love to say that we are really trying to hit the 500 yeah. mark by the end of July. That's just kind of our sort of arbitrary goal. Our, uh, our July 26th is our uh, anniversary. So we yep. would love to see uh, a 500 uh, subscriber mark at that point uh, as we end up our second year and head into the third year. So... So yeah, if head to youtube.com slash tabletop bellhop, hit up a, hit us with the subscribe. You can turn on notifications if you want to know when we post something. We post almost every day on YouTube. Yep. Monday we've got an unboxing video. Tuesday the full podcast episode comes out. Thursday are any actual plays, though we're gonna supplement that this week with a box uh, boxing, reboxing, uh, mm. box insert build. building. Yeah, insert build. Box build, uh, insert uh, we're gonna start calling them the room upgrades but I didn't think of that until after the episode. <laughs> so it's not in the video, but I want to start calling them the room upgrades because we're upgrading the board games. Um, Fridays are our review segment from the podcast goes live. Sunday, the Ask the Bellhop segment from the podcast goes live. And then Saturdays, if we record anything else. So if what's missing in there is Gloomhaven actual plays, which we currently can't do due to the pandemic. Right. Those those were the Thursday, the Thursday upgrade. Yeah. Uh, and uh, generally speaking... Three o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern time is when our content goes live, except for the podcast. Podcast is always 2 a.m. Eastern time uh, to hit the podcatchers so that when you wake up Tuesday morning, it's there, it's there for you. Yep, exactly. All right. I think that pretty much, I don't know what, what other, I don't think we're on a uh, Pinterest has been going really well actually that's another one i don't know if people follow us on on pinterest but you can head over to pinterest.com i think it's forward slash tabletop bell up it should be it's almost everything's been set up there now i am way behind on getting content on there like i think i'm on episode 33 or something like that and we're recording episode 93 tonight so i'm like 60 episodes behind but what i have put out there seems to be doing rather well um I've, we've gotten some good positive feedback from other bloggers who love our pins and possibly want me to create pins for them. They're not gamers, so they're not. It's not really our market. It's just people who like, dang, those are good pins. So people like my pins. The only thing I got to stop doing is having them send to Twitter. I think the days I'm uploading them because I tend to do about 14 in a day 
when I do sit down and work on Pinterest pins. Right. So that one's doing all right. Do we do we have a TikTok account? We do. Oh, okay. I we have a TikTok account. I have not done anything with it. Um, supposedly the hottest board game reviewer in the world right now is because they are doing one minute videos on TikTok and and getting paid by publishers to do one minute reviews on TikTok. So. Well, if you can do it, I mean that is a skill. You can't you can't just do that off the cuff. You've got to yeah. You got to know what you're doing crap. for a one minute video. Absolutely. I'll admit I have not checked out this particular person, but there is a lot of buzz about their work. That it's it's on my list to do. I have tiktok on my phone i registered for an account i follow a few of our gem friends because i was like i don't know what to do with this so i started searching names of people who i knew used it um one person in particular was like yeah i use tiktok whenever i'm feeling down i just boot it up and i'm like all right i don't get it it's a bunch of people dancing to music or doing stupid things to music i i don't understand yeah I, we're, we're, we're not their market with them. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're not the, we're not really the tiktok market no so yeah, I, I, the, Deanna's saying she's too old for TikTok. I, at some point, I think we're supposed to record a video for her, her side of uh, not the bellhop, but her work. Yeah. Someone wants a TikTok video. So I don't know. I, I looked at it. I can't. I, I haven't even tried to make a video. I was thinking about it. I'm like, you know, I'm playing whatever game. Maybe I just do like a flyover with my phone or something. <laughs> I don't know. I, I need to. I, I don't know if I need to. So this is something else. Here's a, another interesting gaming conversation that's going on in the industry right now is a, I wouldn't say a fight, but a discussion between publishers and content creators on how much social media managing should a content creator do for a publisher. So because the publisher gives me a game and I put out a review, is it now my responsibility to share that on 80 different social media platforms? Or is it the company's social media manager's responsibility to share that on 80 different content providers? And how reasonable is it for a publisher to say to say me, hey, you released a video for the alpha. We need to see that on TikTok when I don't go on TikTok. And the general pushback is that social content creators or so, uh, content creators should stick to the medium they know and, and like, like stick to your field, stick to your, your river, right? Like don't jump wherever. Yeah. But – there should be an expectation that you do share it on whatever platforms you are on. And it should be something that's discussed before the game was given over, which I agree with all that. It's the very much the, you shouldn't spread yourself too thin, like pick what you're good at and stick to it. Yeah. Um, people yeah, are mean, already seeing Again, we're, 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 we're 40 year old white guys. Uh, TikTok is not really our specialty. Now that's not to say that it couldn't be, you know, if yeah. we had, that that vibe uh, and, and the, the ability to to do those really concise videos and had that skill set, we could. Um, not not saying that a forty year old guy can't make a great TikTok video, yeah. but the really the really tight beat you know on the beat content style isn't what we do. Yeah. Uh, and so, and is it worth learning? Probably not. Though, which yeah. is more where I was going. <laughs> yeah. Is 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 that a skill set that would actually help us out? Right. Yeah, and and and, and Ryan, Ryan points in the chat. Time to start grooming the children for it because they, they are yeah. they, they, they some of them old. do have that. Uh, you know, they, they are growing up in that form of media. Yes. Uh, for me, I mean, I don't even do Instagram. I, I can't. I was a photographer, and I I yeah. have some issues with Instagram. I have some issues with Pinterest. Uh, and and I just chose not to go in that direction personally. So, all right. Let's go on to at least one more question. How what are we how are we looking for time? Oh, uh, we're <laughs> good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, you know, we're we're probably coming up with about that one more question All time. Right. What do we got? Let's see if we get one or two more. All right. Actually, if we get a really good one in the chat, we'll do it. Sure. Uh so All right. So I got one for you, Sean, instead. All right. This comes from patron of the show, Roger, Roger Malosh. We all know and love Roger. Uh, he has started tinkering with Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator. He wants to know, which, between us, really, what's your preferred choice of the two? Now, the thing is, I'm not on both. So, first off, he wants to know which one, in your opinion, would be the best choice for a game designer to play, test, and promote their games. Now, Tabletop Simulator... I downloaded, I played around with for a bit. I technically have it, but I didn't try it out much. Tabletopia, until very recently, I couldn't use on my computer. There, It ends up there was a, a Chrome plugin interfering, but I didn't know that. 
Um, now that that's fixed, I could technically play with it, but for a long time there, I couldn't even get it to load. So I couldn't check it out. So Roger's wondering, Roger is a local game designer. He started converting his games into 3D medium and into digital space and is wondering which of the two uh, are better to you because I know you've used both. Yeah, no, I, and I have. And uh, I actually, I glance at Discord right now and Roger seems to have chosen Tabletop Simulator because he's using it right now. Ah. But uh, uh, for, for me, I think there's actually two separate things here, unfortunately. And this is actually a problem that I see with with this uh right now uh because right now you've got the, the two big ones i think are tabletopia and tabletop simulator there aren't really too many other options out there right now but right now i think for the designer to work in to design and have the most flexibility for their game i think tabletop simulator is probably the best choice uh unfortunately i think tabletopia is probably better to market and promote in i think it has a little bit more polish to it and is going to be a little more user friendly now if you are someone who hangs out on board game geek you're probably not going to care you're going to be comfortable either way but for the average public who's used to a little more polish and shine on the interface they're going to be more likely to drift towards tabletopia because it's it just feels more finished. Uh, one of the things I noticed about Tabletop Simulator, the first time I grabbed it, was it felt old. Uh, mm. it, it's under constant upgrade. It's, it's very, it is fresh. Uh, it is new. They are, they are keeping it updated, but it has a very dated feel to the interface. Uh, and that's something that I think may put off some people who you may be aiming for your game. Now, if your game is for the, the gaming uh, you know, the hobby gamers, the people who hang out on Board Game Geek, then I think Tabletop Simulator is probably your go-to choice, hands down. Most people already have it, I think, is is, is what's going to happen there. So, so, uh, so one of the questions, though, is does Tabletop Simulator doesn't have a web version, right? Like no. Tabletopia, anyone can get on, whereas Tabletop Simulator, you've got to install Steam, you've got to download Tabletop Simulator, you've got to install it. Then you also have to download the mod pack for whatever game you want to play, whereas Tabletopia just feels like going to Board Game Arena, but it's 3D. Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, that's 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 really the whole thing is you, you've you got uh, that, that polish and that interface is right there for you. Um, you know, you it's hard to beat. <laughs> it's... Um, it's hard to beat that uh, that interface and that uh, proximity to your clients. Basically, is is is, is when you're you're not separated by the uh, the interface of of Tabletop Simulator, the purchase of Tabletop Simulator. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, you know, it's Tabletopia. You, it's right there. You go to the website, you click on the game, and you good and you're good to go. All right, now, do you know if can you play designer games on Tabletopia with a free account? Uh, or do I, you need a paid account to be able to, like, say, play Roger's prototype? I, I believe that may be up to the designer. I am not 100% oh, uh, yeah. sure. And, I, and I'm, I'm hesitant to go to Tabletopia right now because yeah. it is a bit of a uh, resource drain. <laughs> so i said it wouldn't um, even run on my system yeah first. so let's I, i'm not going to risk that right now and unfortunately i didn't have that one that 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 bit uh ready to go fair but, enough fair enough um, let's say i know yeah. roger's been trying both of them yeah um I, so I, as I, as someone who's going to play games you recommend as yourself as as a gamer who's played games on both which would you rather play games on uh i think I prefer Tabletop Simulator. It seems yeah. to be the more powerful engine. It's not limited by the web. Again, mm -hmm. one of the problem, you know, the, the benefit of Tabletopia is you go to the web and it's right there, but that's also a limitation, right? You don't have quite as much power because you are stuck with what you can do in someone's web browser. Uh, and as we sure. saw, you, you know, you couldn't even load yeah. it up for quite a while. Uh, and that's going to drive people away. Whereas if you download the game, if you can, you know, your your if you can download the game and play it on steam and and from steam uh and you you fit all the whatever the minimum requirements are mm -hmm. you're going to be good to go uh with whatever someone can put into it fair enough 
uh, yeah, Tabletopia, I, I will give them a thumbs up for their customer support once once I actually took the time to com not complain about it, but look into it. Uh, just Googling it didn't work. I got a hold of someone on Twitter, and they got in a live chat with me and walked through it. It actually went really well. It was it was a good way to good way to get it set up and it was all like i said it was a matter of chrome settings it was it was background settings and of course the way i found out it was chrome settings is is the evil person made me download edge but except for the fact that i had to download edge it went really well right yeah no and unfortunately you know it, that's something uh, that's a real problem and now thankfully they have a support team that's able to go through yeah. that but the average user isn't going to go to that level and even reach yeah. out to support they're going to go to that website if it fails, and they're going to go gonna away work. and they're going to go get something else that yeah. someone else said worked, which is probably Tabletop Simulator. Yeah, I just, it, I wish Tabletop Simulator was free. The way, the fact they're charging for games makes me feel the platform should be free, but. Well, now to I be fair, to be fair, not all the money. games are, you don't have to pay for all the games. Uh, there is a number of the higher end content, uh, you know, your, your premium games like Wingspan, uh, which. Yeah. They are, you know, you have to buy Wingspan because it's still new hot, new hotness in the game stores. Yep. Uh, people, Fair. people are having trouble getting that. But if you want to download um, Dino Island, uh, it's there. It's there. Um, you know, I have a copy of it. We could play it right now. Oh, yeah. yeah, whereas Tabletopia, a lot of the, the popular games are behind a paywall. Yeah. When I went there, I and the ones that were free were not the easiest to use. So, so my limited experience with Tabletopia was I booted up Azul, and I played it long enough to realize I was going to have to draw one tile out at a time and place them on the market myself. And I'm like, nope, I am not drawing the whatever yeah. five well, twenty <laughs> tiles required to yeah. start a round of Azul. I'm well, like, and nope. unfortunately, that's actually a limitation of a lot of these games. Uh, you know, again, it is. These games are there to represent the tabletop, simu you know, the simulation of the tabletop. So if you need to draw things, it's in many cases going to make you draw them. Now, the author can go ahead and put in macros and speed up some of that stuff. But that's totally up to the, you know, the author of that implementation to do. Otherwise, you are going to have to draw all the cards, draw all the cubes, roll all the dice, whichever. Uh, and that's one of the, you know, the, the problems of a tabletop simulator is it's a simulation. Yeah, even if it let me draw four at a time, I wouldn't have mattered as much because you always draw four. Because, yes, in real life, I have to draw tiles. Of the oh, and there goes the Mo. We, uh, we, we lost the Mo briefly. He should be right back. And... Uh, and here's the Mo back again. Wow. Okay. Uh, so it is. I didn't just even know been... there was a problem until all of a sudden Skype closed. Yeah. No. It, it it was an all of a sudden problem. It did not. It did did not. Hey, I'm up. actually huge. Like we have good quality now. Uh, ish. Um, I'm not all sure. I've lost. I've lost track of what the right size yeah, who is knows anymore. What the right size um, is. But uh, okay. So we got one more question that came in from the chat room, and uh, <laughs> then we're gonna wrap it up. And uh, just like to say hi to Sean P. Kelly in our chat room. Another hey, Sean. Sean at, you know what? We had a, a, a over density of Sean's that caused the problem. That's, you know, we've no, talked about this before. Weird Sean Morning density, Star's not here. If Weird Morning true. Star joins in, then. That's then... true. All right, we're, we're still, we're still without, only at two Sean's. Sean Hamilton to join <laughs> Sean from Hamilton. Yeah, we're, and, we're still. And Sean from Madison, I think it is. Yep. yep. I might be wrong on that. Uh, so yeah, we're, 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 only at, we're only at two, not three Sean's. So we, we yes. haven't, uh, we haven't two hit Sean's the maximum. Fine. All right. So it's last question. Last question of the episode uh, is, uh, and this one comes from Anshi Games. Uh, as I sort of resize you yet again, uh, <laughs> what is the number one game you'd like to see go digital? Huh. I should think about this. <laughs> if you got an answer, go ahead. Because I, gotta... uh, you know what, it's it's tough. There's so many games that I mean, right now, I think if you ask, you know, in the last week or so, Pulsar. Uh, is the one 2849 yeah pulsar 2849 i would love to be able to play with you guys right now yep. uh and you know otherwise i'd be able to you know swing down to windsor and, and and get a game in but seeing as how that's not an option i'd love to find a, a copy of pulsar digital interestingly enough today uh, on the topic of digital games code names just went digital oh they, uh, that was new okay i didn't yeah. know that was new code names dot games is now the okay. uh, the the site to go to 
So you can play it for all your digital code names. Yeah. You know what? That game should work great. Like, you know what? The, one of the problems in person is you can read people, and you're not supposed to do that in code names. Right. Like, it's not meant to be social deduction. That is part of it. It's like, oh, I saw you looking over there. Like, that's definitely part of the game, but it shouldn't be. So it should actually play better digital. Yeah. The other one is Blood Rage. The Blood Rage digital just went live today, and I know a lot of people love Blood Rage. That is not going to be my choice. I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I don't like playing digital games as much as playing in person. So wasn't there another one? where we were talking about playing with John or was it Pulsar? I thought there was something else in the last little while. We were like, to, uh, we were sitting there thinking, I wish there was a digital version. We yeah, were I know. There's, 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 I'm sure there's, there's something other ones. this week, like in the last week. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, this. I, I, I'm playing so many games on board game arena. It's <laughs> yeah. hard to, it's hard to think of what else I would want to play, but. There's definitely there's there's always more games. Oh, em the Eminent Domain expansions. Yes, we don't have the That's, expansions. We, for we have domain. the base game. So so one yep. of, this is pile of obligation problem. I need to review Eminent Domain Exotica. I as far as I'm concerned, I'm done. I have final thoughts on Eminent Domain Exotica, but I have never played Eminent Domain Exotica with more than two people, and I've never played Eminent Domain Exotica with um, Escalation with more than two people. Now the first one. I can tell how it'll play with more people. I played enough games. We played enough eminent domain. I don't need to play that with more people, but the escalation part, I really can't tell. Like there were some issues that came up playing two player that may be solved playing more. And I have no clue. And I have no way to test that until we're allowed to gather with more than five people and with more than one family. Um, Cause that is not a game I am going to teach my oldest daughter. It's just not something she's going to be interested in. And it's, there's a lot of other stuff I'd rather teach her first if I'm going to deep dive her into heavier games. So that's one of the problems. Uh, but I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I guess Pulsar would be nice. Um, I remember for a long time I wanted Eclipse, and I guess the Eclipse has been pulled. I think Twilight Imperium. Twilight Imperium, whatever, 3rd edition, 4th edition, a really good implementation of that I think I would really like, especially if you could do turn-based play with like the full – I think it goes up to eight players with all the expansions – because that game takes so long to play normally, and there are so many tech trees and cards to keep track of, and I am certain every time we play Twilight Imperium, someone's cheated in some way inadvertently, they're the, an unintentional cheating. Someone's played Extreme without realizing it, because there's just so much going on. There's counters moving around and having to spend things and put things on the map and remove things, and I'm sure someone has moved a ship through a spot that already had a control marker and stuff like that. Whereas a computer would take care of all that. You wouldn't have to have to worry about your control markers and how much power you have left and which text you've unlocked. And you forget your text. You're like, oh, you're rolling, and then three things later, you're like, oh, wait, I have orbital bombardment. I should have rolled another die. So there, I think I think Twilight Imperium, I'll say 4th edition. Uh, it could have been 3rd, but 4th edition being the newest. I would love a like a good, like I want it to feel like the board game. I don't want them to, to spruce it up and change it. I just right. want that experience digitized with everything, the math done for us. Yeah, now unfortunately, I don't know TI. I have to say, I've been playing Stellaris lately, which is, again, which is 4X yeah, uh, it's, in it's the extreme, the but I think it's probably uh, a lot more uh glammed up than 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 just the the ti experience so oh there you go there's a mod pack for tabletop simulator unofficial. well yeah and unfortunately most of the mod packs for t for tabletop simulator yeah. are unofficial um that's a that's a pretty uh, uh, of, of dubious uh legality too i'm sure yeah there's some copyright uh, is issues with the uh the cards and things that get put up on tabletop simulator and you know you'll you'll notice when you download a lot of tabletop simulator packs that the uh, the link for the materials goes to Google Drive, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I do want to uh, shout out uh, thanks to Sean in the chat giving us some suggestions. Other than Skype, it's all stuff. Like I said, in the next week, we we may be back here next week without Skype. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, we we do have a now. I do now have a solution that uh, if I move everything away from one OBS to a different OBS, that can can help deal with the Skype problem. But uh, avoiding the Skype problem completely may not be the worst yeah. solution that as well as going to. Yeah, that um, might be a better option. That yeah. is for sure. All right. Well, uh, we are not going to jump into the lobby because, well, we've just been in the lobby for the yes. entire time. 
Uh, where is that? That's right, right. So that's it for this month's AMA. Remember, you can find lots of gaming topics and advice like this over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Gaming Advice at the top of the page. Uh, finally, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me directly, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Up next, a look at a new light, new light strategy game from Bicycle Cards, The Alpha. Uh, the Alpha was designed by Ralph Rosario and features breathtaking art by Andrew Hutchinson. The game is scheduled to be released mid-June 2020 by Bicycle, the United States playing card company. For a look at what you get with a copy of The Alpha, check out our unboxing video over on YouTube. You can find a link to that in the show notes. Now, I gotta say, the most shocking thing you'll find during that video was that the Alpha doesn't have any cards. Like, not only is it not a card game, there are no cards in this box, which I just assumed would be in there because it's from Bicycle, like the, the card game company. I figured I was getting a card-based game. Now, taking a quick look at Bicycle's website, they do have a few other non-card-based games, but they're usually related to cards like Pokino or other card game-adjacent games. I, plus, you know what? Except for the lack of cards, everything else is top-notch. Everything's good. Uh, it just wasn't what I expected. There's a nice four-fold mounted board, some really cool wolf meeples, uh, some nice thick tiles, some really confusing dice that honestly don't make any sense. Like, it's probably worth watching an unboxing video just to see me get totally confused by these dice. Uh, they do make sense once you start playing, but wow, like, just odd dice. D6s. Well, well, speaking of playing the game, how about you give us a quick overview of how the alpha plays? All right. You start by laying out the board. You place a wolf on the food track, which is the main thing on the board. It's also the score track. It shows your score at five. Uh, then you're going to put a number of hunt tiles. So different tiles representing different things, different types of prey based on the number of players. Some of these are small prey. Some are large prey. Some go below the board, which represents the near forest, and some go above the board, which is the deep forest. You then play through the following phases in order, the first being stock. Players, in turn, are going to place wolves on their hunts. There are some special placement rules for this, but uh, like the uh, only one wolf can be on the livestock tile, and the scavenge spots can have any number of wolves, but only one per player, for example, but there's some other ones. Another important note is that if you go to the deep woods, it costs you one food, so you're losing points to go hunt in the deep woods. Next is catch. This is represents the chase. Uh, your wolf's trying to hunt the prey, and it's done by rolling a die at each of the hunts. Results include a failed hunt, which is an X, a successful hunt, which will be a number, which is the number of food you're going to get, a wounded prey, which will then turn to carry in next turn. This is represented by a C and a number. And then also there's one special die for the livestock hunt, which can result in a wolf getting killed, getting shot and killed and removed from the game. Once you've rolled all your catches, you then go back through each hunt and resolve them. I got to admit, that seemed a little weird to me. I don't know why you wouldn't do both at once, but as written, you roll all the dice, then you go back and resolve them. At each successful hunt, you determine which wolf pack is dominant. This is pure area control. The player with the most wolves is dominant. If players are tied, multiple packs are dominant. The dominant hunts packs then decide if they're going to fight for the food or share it with the other dominant packs. Now, this is potentially multiplayer prisoner's dilemma with two or more players. It can be up to six players if all six players have the same number of wolves in the spot. Uh, typical player uh, prisoner's dilemma. If one pack out of all of them fights, they get all the food. If multiple packs fight, each wolf in that, those packs, or each pack, a wolf from each pack, sorry, a wolf from each pack gets hurt. And any packs left share the food. If all packs share, then you divide the food up equally. Now, at the end of each round, um, you take your wolves back from all the hunts. Injured wolves move to a healing spot. Any that are on the healing spot get returned. The player with the most food becomes the new alpha first player. And then any prey that were injured get flipped to the carrion side. And any carrion that were there last turn get flipped back to their normal side. You end up doing this for a total of four, five turns. Five turns, which represent five weeks. At the end of the fifth week, whoever has the most food wins the game. 
Now, this is no, just an overview. I, this is not a full rules tutorial. There are some small details I completely skipped over, like how carrying and scavenging works and why certain things don't have dice and some do. Don't worry about that right now. Just want to get the general overview. Honestly, I can't help but think about Blood Bowl when you're describing some of these man mechanics and the special dice. I, you know, I, turn, I don't know. I turn don't over. see the Blood Bowl here, but I guess that's just hearing it and not seeing it. I, you know, you, you, turn, o you turn over when you re to recover and you wait, you know, all, <laughs> all the recovery rules. I don't know. Fair enough. Now, I got to say, uh, overall, the alpha for me was uh, just a bunch of surprises stacked on top of each other. Like, first off, I was surprised to know that Bicycle was making hobby board games. Now, I've learned since then, this is actually their second wave of trying to break into the hobby board game market. And I got to say, I looked up those previous games, and it looks like they're doing a better job this time. Well, it seems like they've really gone all out with the product quality to help them stand out. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the second thing I was shocked to learn is it wasn't a card game. Basically what I mentioned already, right? The first, the, like the name Bicycle, I expect a card game. Like there are plenty of great card games out there. Some of my favorite games are card games. It just, to me, would have made sense to have Bicycle make a card game. So with a little bit of history behind this, uh, Bicycle is one brand of the U.S. playing card company who are now, as of December last year, owned by Carton Bundy a Belgium-based company self-described as the world's largest manufacturer and distributor of playing cards and board games. Huh. Added on to that, there is a partnership between Hasbro and Carta Monday, who seem to produce most of Hasbro's products outside the U.S. Uh, Bicycle alone generated about $118 million in revenue in the year prior to their acquisition. Uh, which probably leads to my next point, which is, how nice this game looks so the, the production quality like the components are top notch i guess when you're as big a company as bicycle you can afford to make a very well produced board game then finally the, the biggest shock to me probably out of all of them i don't know the card thing's the biggest shock second biggest shock is just how solid a game this is like when i was first contacted about reviewing this game and another game called the exchange that's their two new light strategy games i wasn't expecting much at all from these I thought maybe I'd end up with a party game that I could break out maybe on New Year's or maybe a light, simple game to play with the kids. And the alpha is actually a step up from that. Though I got to admit, not that big a step. It's what I would consider an excellent gateway game, like a great game for new gamers. It takes some rather basic mechanics, presents them in a simple and pure way. First off, you got area control system where players are placing their wolves to see who can control each spot. It's followed up by a very Ameritrash output randomness system where you're rolling your dice to see if you actually happen to get food or not. That's uh, very much a push your luck mechanic. And then you have what's multiplayer prisoner's dilemma when you get to the conflicts. It's do you fight or not? If one person fights, they win. If no one fights, you all win. Added to this are some neat bits, like uh, the livestock in particular, is get a ton of food, get a bit of food, get away free or die. And there is a 50-50 chance you're going to die by going after that which is neat because that becomes a great catch-up mechanic because if you're falling behind, you take your chance on the livestock, which just kind of makes sense, right? And you actually have to look at risk versus reward when picking where to hunt. And this is where I think the game started to shine was with showing it to my kids and them seeing that risk versus reward mechanic and how it works. So I think there are also some potential drawbacks for some kids though, right? Well, the thing is, this is not a happy, cute animal game, right? So there could be some problems with some families it, with, with the content of this game. This is a game about wolves hunting and killing and eating other animals. And when the packs hunt, uh, they can fight each other. So you have direct conflict. You have carrion, which the art's pretty photorealistic. So you've got a rotting carcass there right on the cards. And then there's the whole fact that your wolves can die while hunting livestock. Not all of that's going to be for every family. Now, I will say my kids loved it. Like, I was a little worried they might not be into this, but they thought it was really cool. And they liked the fact that it was, they kept saying, oh, it's realistic. It's, it's so realistic. I like that it's really, I like that it feels like we're hunting. And I like that if we go after the sheep from the farmer, might shoot us. And they thought that was really cool that the game was presented in a realistic way. And I have to say, I'm not one to um, cartoonify reality for my kids. Animals mm -hmm. kills things. The food web is real and an important thing to learn in school and, you know, in the classes yep. that they're taking. Uh, and it's not that the game is graphic about things. 
even if some no. you know some of the gra- some of the uh, the art is realistic it's not graphic it simply presents situations to uh some that some children may not be ready for yet yeah and and I, if i remember correctly it's not actually designed for kids based on the the age on board game geek i don't remember what it is Four, off the top 14 of my... 14 is the age on board game geek yeah so you're not looking at a kids game there anyway a 14 year old should have no problem with this theme now while the components are great the game plays decent this isn't groundbreaking in any way it's it, it's nothing to be honest nothing special it does some pretty basic hobby board game things and does them well enough, but that's about it. Like, except for the area control element of the game, there is a ton of randomness. Like, yes, you get to pick where your wolves go, so you have full control of that, but then they could go there and just roll a miss and get nothing, right? There's that, that high output randomness, which is not something that a lot of strategy gamers are going to enjoy. Plus, it's really hard to plan ahead at, because you never know what's going to happen because of the dice. Yeah, and as we know, randomness is a huge dividing line for many gamers and can make or break a game in that hobby community. Yeah, due to that, I have no idea how this is going to play out. Like, to be honest, when this comes out later next month, I don't know how this is going to get reviewed. I have looked at a couple other reviews, and some people are digging it, and a lot of people are disliking it. So we'll see. Overall, I personally think this wolf-based foray into the deep woods of hobby gaming from Bicycle is a very solid game. It's a solid attempt. It looks fantastic. It plays well. I don't think it's going to win over the hobby game market or any hobby gamers, but I think it's a pretty good gateway game, and it's a good teaching tool for younger gamers, especially in teaching risk versus reward and the whole brilliance of the prisoner's dilemma. The prisoner's dilemma is a really neat mechanic, and this is it in a very pure basic form. There's there's not, nothing shiny. There's nothing modifying it. It just here it is. Here's the prisoner's dilemma. You have two options. You either both go for it and you both get rewarded or only one of you goes for it and they get everything. Which way do you go? And if you both go for it, you both get punished. Sorry, that's your three basic outcomes of the prison dilemma. It's there in all its glory, which is really, they did a good job of, I think, capturing that mechanic. And to be honest, there's a lot of tie into theme here that you wouldn't expect. But the fact that the wolf packs can fight or share, the fact that going hunting for livestock is dangerous, the fact that it's harder to pull down a bison than it is to catch a rabbit. But if you pull down the bison and you're successful, you get a ton more food. That's all in the game. So I think they did a good job of capturing that theme with the mechanics they have. Yeah, no, I think this is going to be a fantastic game to find in your scholar's choices Mm -hmm. uh, or other more family and educationally oriented game stores. It's not something that your FLGS is necessarily going to put up on their front shelf and push. But... That's to say, to you know, that being said, there is definitely a place for this game, especially mm-hmm. in the educational and entry level gaming market. Yeah, I could also see this at a, at a, or in Canada, at least Toys R Us or Target or Zellers or right. no more Zellers, but uh, <laughs> entry Walmart, level, yeah, yeah. Walmart or whatever. I can definitely see it and possibly do well. I don't know how well the box would sell there because it doesn't look like a mass market game. But right. you know what? Hobby games are getting more and more common in those areas, especially with the Ravensburger games all being popular. I I think this is going to fit that niche better than, you know, like you said, the local game store. I'm not, I can't see our local store really pushing this one and it doing that well for them. Right. Well, for a more in-depth review, look at the alpha. You can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews. And now, the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? So the big thing that happened since we were last here is Skype updated and ruined our episode tonight and put us off our game. No, other than that, um, I don't know. Like, last week was another good week for gaming. Like, we got in a ton. Uh, Not that I'm complaining here. So, I had quite a bit to cover. First one, though, is actually one I missed from last week that I actually wanted to mention. In our feedback section, section, I mentioned that Frank Menser, the the man who made the D&D Red Box that many of us grew up with, suggested Black Box as a two-player game for Deanna and I to try. And when he did that, he provided with a link to play online. Now, this is a solo-only thing where, like, you can't play two-player. You just play, you just, you know, pick the number of balls that randomly places them. 
and man, is it well done. Like it looks identical to the board game. It uses the same zigzag shape, uh, yet orange and yellow plane pieces. Like this looks like the game I own from the seventies. Well, it's my dad's copy. I'm old, but not quite old enough for that. <laughs> it's my dad's copy of the game, but I own an original printing of it. Man, it does a really good job. And it recreates the game literally perfectly as a one player experience. Like uh, it's, it's, Kind of cool because Black Box is a unique game to learn. Uh, there are some really unique rules for how the lasers move inside the box based on where the atoms are. Because it's actually based on actual atoms and how things work. And what I dig about this is one of my fears for playing the actual Black Box in person is screwing something up on one side or the other. The, the, uh, Deanna's going to play with me and she's going to say, I fire a laser for here and I tell her it comes out here and I'm wrong. It should have came out somewhere else. And I think this is a great tool to get past that learning curve so that you memorize how the different patterns work. I think it's a cool way to make sure you have rules down before playing the physical game, which is something I want to do. Like I'm hoping in the next week, that's on my list for the next week. Just cause it's been on my pile of shame since we cleared out my parents' house. And I just kind of want to nail that one off and then let's see if Deanna likes it and either get rid of it or keep it based on that. Well, yeah, I have to say I, I, uh, I clicked on the link. Um, and I think if we weren't having so many technical difficulties, it would make me focus on, on our <laughs> technical aspects. I'd probably still be over there playing it. I didn't realize that I knew this game. Uh, yeah, as it's... soon as I opened it up, I'm like, oh, this. Okay. Now, see, I've played it um, as black holes. You're saying atoms. Okay. For me, it was always black holes. Uh, so I don't know where I know this game huh. from. But the physics... Uh, I know perfectly well, and it's black hole. It was always black holes that caused light to bend in this, in the manners that they do. And, and as soon as I play it, I'm like, oh yeah. So if I press here, okay, that means there must be one here. Um, but See, when uh, I learned it, it, it was definitely it was, it was shooting protons at atoms. Interesting. So I don't know. Okay. Uh, we'll have to. Well, maybe we'll have have some feedback for next week and see if it's based on anything. Yeah, maybe we'll have to. We'll have to dig out and, anything. In real we'll have to dig out where it, where it where it or originates from. But uh, again, laser chess meets Minesweeper is is sort of one way yep. to describe this game. Yeah, it's definitely a neat game. Like, there, there's definitely something there. It's it's a classic. I, I don't. We'll see how well it plays out as a physical game, but definitely digital, it works great. Uh, up next, we played the Alpha a lot, which makes sense, right? That's that's why we did the review today. Uh, first played it with the kids, so just the three of us, and then I had Deanna join in as well, just to make sure we could try it with a higher player count. And the big thing that shocked me about this that I didn't really, like I alluded to it in the review, was how much my kids got into this game. Like Deanna was commenting about hearing them, enjoying themselves from upstairs. Because like at first I didn't think they'd, they'd like the theme, uh, the whole animals eating animals. I thought they'd be upset about that. But man, they embraced it. Like they, they embraced it. They were like, I'm going to go take down an elf or... Uh, little G was all about, I want to catch the bunnies. I want to catch the fish. She liked, she liked going for the smaller prey, where Big G was much more about going for the bigger prey and pushing her luck. I was also worried they wouldn't get the prisoner's dilemma aspect, but that was unfounded too. Though I got to say, both girls seem pretty mean. Like, uh, they don't seem to choose share too often, so you got to watch that. In the game, at least, they've always been perfectly polite whenever I've been over. <laughs> yeah, I think they take it out in the game. They're like, here's my chance to fight with Dad. I don't know. There, there was an awful lot of fighting going on in our games. Next was an online game. This was Level X. Uh, the only reason I did this is I got an email notification from Happy Meeple. This is one of the sites we talked about a few weeks back when talking about digital board gaming. It's a place that's all two-player only games with a bunch of weird um, microtransaction app-like things. I basically forgot about the site. It noticed that and emailed me. It was like, hey, you haven't taken a turn in forever. And I'm like, oh, at the time, I happened to be waiting for something to upload. So I'm like, why not? And I went over there and the next game on the list that I hadn't played. So by playing the tutorials, you earn these like white meeple. I hadn't earned a white meeple on level X. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to play level X. So I played, I think, three times, whatever was required to get my white meeple. And I stopped. Now, this is another game. And it seems like there are way more of these out there than I realized. Games where you roll a set d6s and pair them and move up tracks based on the total of the numbers uh the most famous being can't stop in this one you roll four dice and what's different is you can make any set of pairs from one or any set any combination there's not to be pairs so it could be four separate dice it could be three with one it could be two with two and so on and there are only five tracks going from five to ten and those are the only numbers that matter and you go up one on each track based on the totals of your dice so if you have like a three left over you get nothing but which is different than those other games because like having a leftover die is different now the first person to reach the end of any track gets a scoring token but then they stay there 
And if they can keep hitting the same number, they take more scoring tokens, which I found different from all the other can't stop style games. Now you only lose that spot if the other player moves on top of you, then you get bumped to the beginning of the track. Uh, there's also some uh, additional scoring for getting complete sets of numbers and stuff like that. It was okay, but I felt more random than can't stop. It just felt more like I'm rolling dice and picking random numbers. And I got to say, I it was neat, but I don't feel a big urge to like go pick up a physical copy or anything like that. Yeah, I had previously played this one on my uh, brief instance at the uh, at that site. Uh, it's very much uh, reminds me of a digital bar top gaming machine yeah. sort of game. That's where it yeah. could stay. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, not, definitely not the best. All right, back to the actual physical gaming table. Uh, here's some ones I know people are looking forward to hearing about. So Saturday night, my wife and I tried Sanctum. For the first time, this is um, meant to be the board game version of Diablo with the serial numbers filed off, published by Czech Games Edition. And I got to say, this definitely had some Diablo like feelings. It definitely had some moments. Uh, the biggest one was just before the big boss fight. You fought through hordes of demons. You have this pile of equipment. You've got your your uh, your two two resources there and a big pool of them. And you're about to get ready for this giant fight and trying to figure out the perfect combination of where what to equip and what not to and what to sell and what potions to buy and everything very much felt like Diablo to me. It was the, I'm about to go to the next floor. What do I need to equip? What can I get? I'm going to hit the town one more time before I go in to make sure there's nothing else I need. You know, it just very much felt like that prepping for the big fight. Yeah, my understanding has always been that it's really that a, a gear acquisition and organization aspect, as much as anything else, uh, theme-wise, that gives it that Diablo, you're playing yeah. Diablo feel. Yeah, the other one too is everything you kill turns to equipment, which I know doesn't happen in Diablo. Like you have to kill waves of things to get stuff, but you're constantly just getting inundated with new equipment, which is very much a, a hoarding from Diablo thing. Thankfully, no inventory you have to worry about, which is nice. No, no going back to town to drop piles of stuff <laughs> on the ground. Uh, overall, so far, my thoughts on Sanctum is a very neat game. Uh, basically, you're drafting monsters to fight, which is a little weird because they're out on the board. Like, you choose who's chasing you, and Deanna would choose who's chasing her. And then to fight them, you're trying to roll the right numbers on your dice and using equipment to modify your die rolls. And you're also using your equipment to prevent die roll damage if you fail to kill the monster. So it's one of those, you kill them, otherwise they hurt you. And very much like a, an advanced version of Roll For It, of all things, which is a like a basic almost party game. Now, to use your equipment, you need to either use Strength, which is your red pool, or Will, which is your blue pool, which is another Diablo callback. And these start off really limited. But as you beat enemies, you start getting more equipment. Every demon card has a piece of equipment on it. And you start leveling up your characters on three different skill tracks. Now, you unlock skills on those tracks, and those will give you more Strength and give you special abilities. Sorry, I shouldn't just say strength. Strength and will. You can get more of each pool and grant you more special abilities that are unique to the four characters. So it also has that asymmetry. Each of the four characters plays completely different based on what skills they have. So this is specifically Diablo 2 that yes. they have uh, you know, scratched the uh, serial numbers off of. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, having not played Diablo 3, it could be Diablo 3-ish. No, no, it's, it's, it's definitely yeah, it's Diablo two. <laughs> 2 with the different character classes. They're probably even the same character classes. I, it's been a long time since I played Diablo. Um, I When we played, Deanna played an archer. I played a thief-style character. So, and okay, then so there's like a there, isn't, there isn't a thief, but usually it's barbarian, uh, ranger, wizard, and, uh, and necromancer is, is some yeah of, i guess some they of decided parts. to stay away from the necromancer <laughs> that's right i played a necromancer so, so they replaced the necromancer with a scoundrel style right. character who was all about spending potions to do things that was my 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 shtick where deanna's was being able to equip equipment without having to use skill points right. which was very different than the way i played but anyway like many check games edition games i think even sean's starting to learn this from this company there's a lot more going on and a lot more thinking required than you'd expect first looking at it uh like it really reminded me of dungeon lords that way because dungeon lords looks like you're gonna play dungeon keeper the silly video game where you can slap goblins and it's really a brain burner though i gotta say sanctum is not nearly as heavy as uh dungeon lords I am looking forward to checking out more. At this point, that's that's my thoughts after one play. There's obviously a lot more to explore in that game. 
Now you may want to wait for the review, and I don't want to. I don't want to press you if you do. But the end of the game, I've read a lot of thoughts about. Do you have Do you have anything you want to comment on that portion of the game? So for one, it's fiddly. It's really fiddly. We played extreme. It was our first time playing, so that's one of the reasons I didn't mention the end of the game. Is we totally forgot that the demon lord roars in between each round and uses a special ability that hits everyone. We completely forgot that. Uh, so despite the fact Deanna. I can't remember if she died in the last round or beat him. I think she beat him and I died in the last round. We don't know if that was true. Plus, I forgot one of my skills that was really important near the beginning of the fight, that every round I could have set one die to any side, and I completely forgot that. But it's just, it's it's fiddly. It's You put out this row of demon cards, and in between you put on this row of rage cards, and then you have to defeat those cards in order, but then you take damage for all the face-up cards that are to the right of it. And it just, it, it, it was a little awkward, so that's going to take some more. And the other thing is, once you get to that point of the game, it is 100% solitaire. There is no way to interact with each other ever again once you hit that point of the game. It's, I play with my board, you play with that board. And honestly, except for the fact that you want to make sure your opponent's not cheating, we could have just sat there and started rolling our dice and done our own thing. Which, I don't know, I it, it's an odd feeling that... You're going through the game kind of progressing, and it's always kind of got that solo feel, but that end fight is 100% here, you do your thing, you do your thing. And what the monster demon's doing to me is nothing to do with what it's doing to her twos, right. except for those roars, which we forgot. That's that one part where it'd be like, right, I guess if you did it, I'm okay. She's like, are you done round one? Are you done? Okay, now we draw the roar card. Okay, now we're going to do our own thing. Are, are you done round two? So right. I don't know. I And I, I again, I don't know good, bad. Just so different... you're you're definitely you're definitely repeating some of the themes I have seen uh, other other people discuss. Um, you know, we'll we'll see we'll see how this continues, and we'll 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 touch back on that end game when we do the review. I suspect. Yeah, it is it is definitely unique. <laughs> I will say that 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 is the weirdest end game I think I've experienced in a game. All right, up next another shiny new one. This is one most people don't even know exists yet because um, it doesn't. And that is Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. I have a prototype of this game that hasn't even been announced yet. It's going to be coming soon to Kickstarter. It is the latest game in the Valeria Kingdom, start, which started with Card Kingdoms and went on to all the other Valeria games. I don't even remember. There was uh, the, the cities and the towns and whatever. There's lots of Valeria games. I'm a big fan. Uh, that's part of why I got the prototype, is I told them how much of a fan I am. I love daily magic games. What I got to say right away is this does not feel like any of the other Valeria games, except in theme. It's got all the theme, it's got all the Miko art, it's got the same world, but mechanically, you're doing something completely different. Uh, most of their games are card-based games, right? You're, you're, you're collecting a tableau. They're tableau builders in almost all cases. The ones that actually say Valeria. Note Horizons from the same company is not like Valeria, which you can check our review for that information. But all the other Valeria games are very much card-driven. And there are cards in this game, but it is not. This is a dice-driven resource management game. Now, interestingly, the thematic flip is you're playing the bad guys, which I actually thought was really cool. You're playing the ravening hordes actually raiding Valeria, which is kind of a neat twist. Now, you do this through an action selection system that involves sending your warlord meeple to one of five different shrines or creating a warband on your main board. But the main thing is going to these shrines. When you get to a shrine, you're going to collect a die and then do a shrine-specific action, and there's five different main actions. These include things like collecting money, collecting mana, recruiting champions. Here's where some of those cards come in. Fulfilling contracts for points. These are based on having certain states in the game, like you've got so many missions completed or certain things on your player board, and they give you points. Collecting mana. Um, sorry, I said that. Uh, collecting champions for points and reserving war bands. Now, most of these cost something. And they're discounted by the value on the die you took. And interestingly, the high number of dice give the less least discount, with like a six gives you nothing, whereas a one gives you a minus five discount. So it incentivizes you to take a low die for the action on that spot. Now, in addition to this, you can play on your board and form a road band and go raiding. Now, you can use a warband that's on the board, or you can use one you reserved earlier, which is a weird gizmo-like mechanic that I've never seen anything but gizmos, which I thought was an interesting twist. And what you do here is you're going to look at the warband card. It's going to show uh, sets of army symbols, two to three of them, and you need to turn in sets of dice in that color. 
and the dice represent different armies. So there's like undead dice and there's vampire dice, whatever, and goblin dice. So you're going to turn these in and get points. Now here, the points are based on the actual numbers on the dice. So here you want those high numbers. So when you're drafting the dice, if you want a bigger discount, you take the low number, but then you want the big numbers for forming your war bands. Then when you finish a war band, you're going to get some points. And then this is a weird one. You're going to, you got this little three by three grid that shows a map of Valeria and you're going to pick which spot on that map to raid. And then you're going to get some bonus for raiding that particular spot. And then you also get a bonus for connecting adjacent spots later. So your second raid, if it's next to your first, you're going to get a bonus. Now, this is a neat mechanic that I've only ever seen one other place, I think, is when you do this, you're removing a chip from your main board, and it goes on this sideboard. Well, the chips on your main board are covering up parts of the board and limit what you can do at the beginning of the game. So part of it is like your score track can only go so far, and you can only recruit true champions at the start of the game, and you can uh, get only you can only reserve one card. And then once you move these chips up, you unlock more stuff, which is really neat. And it really reminds me of a game called Rail Russian Railroads, which is actually my favorite engine builder of all time, where as you get bonuses in the game, you place them on your board to get new things. This is kind of the opposite of that. You're taking stuff off to unlock stuff. And I got to say, that is a really neat mechanic. Yeah, although I, I, to me, you say that, and I think immediately of uh, Terra Mystica, or of uh, uh, Clans of Caledonia, well, where you, when, when you take it's your people off. It's not income, though. This yeah, is, no, it's not, it's not income. It's, it's, it's abilities. Although, uh, Terra Mystica, when you, when you place your, yeah, uh, you know, stronghold. when you place your stronghold, yeah, fair, you get fair, a new fair, ability. Very yeah, very uh, similar. When you place your stronghold, you unlock something new. This would be very similar to that. So I have to say, it was shocking to see these pieces keep coming out uh, on something with the Valeria name and, and see yeah. very few cards at all. <laughs> like, like there are the champions, and you recruit yeah. the champions, and they go in a tableau. But like at the beginning of the game, you can only hold three. So you only have three of those champions. And then there, the war bands you have to form are cards. But it's more like it's a card that has three symbols on it. When it's done, it gets track, tucked into a scoring spot. Yeah. It's not like building a tableau that it enhances your engine. And my, my first thought was, you know, is there a potential for this becoming a, a sort of a... a, a connected to the other valeria games where you can choose and play either the bad guys or the, but it doesn't sound like there's any any way to sort of link these two there's no there's no way no, for them to interlock like, nothing, nothing i can see no not at it's, all yeah strange strange choice but we'll see if it's an interesting it, uh, yeah it was like that for the other ones too though like villages of valeria and quest for valeria there's no overlap there and you can't use any of those with valeria card kingdoms true despite all three being card games You'd almost wish they could put out champions that work in all three games, but it's not a choice they chose to go with. For all I know, they might all be different designers. I actually don't know. That's not something I looked up before writing this to see who designed this. Uh, to be honest, I don't even know if there's a Board Game Geek page yet. I didn't go look. There probably is. They're probably smart enough to have one of those. But at this point, I will say, like, I just gave a ton of info on this game. This is only our first play, right? So Deanna and I have played once. Um, far as I know, we didn't play extreme, but you never know. Uh, it's definitely one of those games where I would play different next time because now I know what's going on. I will say it's rough from the rule book reading this from the rules. I had no idea what I was doing or what I knew. Again, I knew what the possible actions were, but didn't grok why I would do any of them. Now, having played, I now see why I would why I would get mana and why I need money and where I would want to buy a champion and how soon I'd want to. Now I see all that. So our second play is going to be very different. Um, do we expect a review for this? I do need to play this with more than two players. Uh, this is one we're probably, and like I said, unless the lockdown ends very soon, we're probably going to, I'm going to recruit Big G to try it out. She is a fan of Card Kingdom, so she's used to at least some of the stuff, some of the themes. So the designer for this game is actually Stan Kordonsky, uh, who doesn't have any other Valeria titles to his name. Yeah, it feels like uh, that. He's done uh, Dice Hospital, um, Endless Winter, exciting. Old West Impresario. Uh, he's got some other games under his belt, but no other Valeria titles. All right. And I, it, it feels that way, to yeah. be honest. It does uh, and I, interestingly, Miko isn't the name on the as the artist. Well, the art I saw definitely looked like it's, Miko. It's uh, me... me that's Miko. Dimitris that's, oh, okay. That's Miko. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's a reason they call him Miko. Okay. Yeah, I did. I had. I just had to click through Dimitris on him. Ah, uh, yes. There it is. Okay. Like once that. I once I click through on him, yes, obviously. Yes. 
Yes, that is the Miko. He goes by Miko because his name is not easy to pronounce. <laughs> kind of wish more designers did that. Right. <laughs> yeah, that that is the Miko. All right. Um, next one. Told you we got a lot this week. This is also from CGE Check Games Edition. That's codenames Duet. Uh, now, fans of the show may remember me completely pulling a 180 on the original codenames. I initially did not like this game. Uh, received a copy as a gift, so broke it out at one of our gaming in the New Year parties and ended up loving it. And to be honest, I'm not going to get into why I, it flipped, but whatever. I now love Codenames. We talked about fans, it. We've talked about uh, it in previous episodes. Yeah, we talked about it previously. Now, fans will also know I'm always looking for two-player date night games. These are games that come in small boxes that Deanna and I can take with us when we leave the house and get away from my mom and the kids and go to coffee shops, pubs, restaurants, hotel rooms, wherever we happen to be. We're always looking for small portable games. And this is why I jumped at a chance to review Codenames Duet, is I wanted to check it out. Now, two things should indicate how well Codenames Duet won went. Uh, on our date night, and that was, first off, we played five times in a row. Uh, so we're going to go three things. Second, we stayed up an hour and a half later than we planned to. We had an alarm set, and we broke that. And third, it's a cooperative game, and Deanna actually liked it. And there we have the biggest shock of the episode. Uh, as I seem to recall, that she had no interest in playing this game other than the fact that you needed to review it, so she was going to play it out of duty. <laughs> yeah that that's pretty much it and and i'll admit she was super skeptical like like when i took it out she basically gave me a dirty look and she's like all right yeah we have to do this one don't we right and then the first round she was still a little hesitant but then once there were a couple things clicked right like one of the things is we figured out that a card could be an assassin for one player but required to guess for the other which is actually kind of fascinating compared to the original code names. It's part of what makes Duet work. And then just a few other tricks. She grew to really enjoy it. Now, I will point out, uh, Deanna did say at the end of the night when we were packing it up, and she kind of took me aside and pointed at me and said, no, this does not replace the Duke. Uh, but she is willing to play the game more. Well, baby steps. You can't change her into a co-op game lover overnight. Yes. And, well... Um, the plan is to play this more because uh, in addition to the base two player game, there is some kind of campaign mode. Like there's a, there's a score sheet in there with a map of the world where you can put some stuff on and you like come up with a team name and stuff that looked kind of neat. Uh, I will admit I didn't read those rules at that time because we were just playing the two player basic. And the other thing that I had no clue, and this is just bad marketing in my, in my opinion is this is not a two player only game. I had no clue. Codenames duet can also be played with a team version and there are team rules in there i had no clue about this well similar had to how we expanded the regular code name player count uh talking about uh you know yeah. by just teaming up now interestingly it, it does say two to four players on their bgg page i just you know what it's just not out there like i said it's yeah. a publicity thing i just assumed it was always two player understandable I just name duet. It's it's kind of like the the fox in the forest and the fox in the forest duet makes you think the fox in the forest is more than two players, right? Whereas duets the co-op and, and this maybe that's the same thing, right? Duet here means co-op versus the other. Again, I didn't read the the team rules because well we didn't have teams. All right, I got one more. Told you a lot of games this week, and that is Quad Heroes. Now I gave a pretty brief overview of this last week the cube based platformer trying to be a uh, mario brothers that was a surprise hit with the N and i well this week i went back through the original three tutorial scenarios this time just with the kids both my girls and wow was, was that a hit like that it's like surprising hit like they loved it um big g absolutely loved this game like i admit it shouldn't surprise me right because she was always a fan of Robot Turtles. She likes Robo Rally. She spends hours a day right now programming in Scratch. I don't know. She's got some kind of store where she sells people cats online. I don't even know. But that's that's her thing now is, I got all my chores done. Can I play Scratch? Now, I guess I, like, I'm saying that's programming, right? Well, Quad Heroes isn't a program programming game. And the, the designer of the game likes to point that out. It is not a program movement game. But it just, like, you don't plan your head moves ahead like you don't plan it out but it just feels like it like you've got the cube in your hand you're like all right if i roll this way i'm then gonna get the slide two and that'll put me on the spring which will make me spring two forward which will get me to the tele like it just has that feel right like especially when you start throwing in cards where you can modify the map and like oh if i destroy this wall then i can get to this spot it just has that 
it feels to me like a programming game, despite the fact I'm not programming. Yeah, I can definitely see how it plays to that mindset and that 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 personality type. Yeah. Uh, even if it doesn't use that specific mechanic. Yeah, this is no this is no Robo Rally. Don't get it. It's not not even like um. League of Legends, the board game. I can't remember the name. My, uh, Mex and Minions. Yep. Mex versus Minions. It's not even that game. This is this is definitely a different mechanic from that. But you just, yeah, it's that mindset. Uh, now, I do have to admit, the first two scenarios went great with both kids. Like, they both loved it. Now, the first scenario all you're using are the basic movement rules. The second scenario introduces the cards. The third one, once you throw in the full rules, like upgrading and leveling up, it was a bit much for my youngest. It just a bit much for her to think of all at once. Like it was just too many things to take into consideration. And I found instead of sitting there and planning things out, she would get impatient and she would just make a move almost random. And in particular, her character had a Q power, which is whenever your Q's up, you do something special. They let her shoot bombs. So she just started to fixate on the, I'm just going to turn any way I can to fire more bombs. While she was having fun doing that, she wasn't really playing the game anymore. She wasn't trying to win. It became more of a, just a, a fun activity for her at this point now i'm thinking going forward we probably will only play with little g if we're playing team base so she can team up with me or her mom so that we can kind of help her make the decisions instead of giving her all those options at once yeah and and the game this game is listed again as 14 and up so right. the community has downgraded it to uh, uh some but uh you know it's not intended for younger players yeah, fair enough. I, I could totally see that. It makes sense. Like I said, uh, Big G loved it. Little G loved it. But once she threw everything in, it was a little bit more than her comfort level. Overall, though, I am loving this game more and more the more I play it. Like, it's, it looks so amazing on the table. The whole mechanic is just brilliant. Uh, this is one that definitely, like, deserves more buzz. Like, I know it, it got the Dice Tower seal of approval. It's not like no one's heard of this game. But I don't really hear, I, in my opinion, enough people talking about it. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week now that you've gotten so many games on the table? Already? Yeah. Oh, I would love a repeat performance, but I don't think it's going to happen. It was not, I, I got to say, what I loved about last week is I got to play some new games. I, like, I, I enjoy playing games I already lo know and love. And while Deanna would prefer we're always playing games she already knows, I personally really love and experiencing new games. That's part of why I do this. It's why I write reviews. It's why I'm into this hobby. And it was, I, I really enjoyed, like, there were a lot of first-time plays in this last week, and that was really cool for me. I really enjoyed that. Now, my plans for the following week, unfortunately, probably aren't going to be to try new games, because quite a few of the games we just talked about are from the pile of obligation, and I want to review them, so I need to get more plays of them in. So I'm expecting more Sanctum, more Shadow Kingdoms, more Quad Heroes, and I do want to check out that whatever that campaign, the map mode is in Codenames Duet, so. All right. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Timothy Smith. Thank you, Timothy. Jeff Seuss. Thanks, Jeff. P.S. Goujon. Thank you. William Fisher. Thank you. Danielle Thomas. Thanks for joining us in the chat yet again. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Or if you'd like to make a one-time or recurring donation, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and hit the tip button. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.